Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a CBC News investigation uncovers disturbing allegations against a longtime junior hockey coach. This, to me, seems predatory. Dozens of inappropriate emails and allegations of problematic behavior. Why it may be just one part of a troubled history. Waiting for a refund for a canceled flight? It's good to hear that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. What sources tell us about the multi-billion dollar deal in the works? Frustration over the pace of vaccination in Canada's largest city. They're stressing it's a race between the variants and the vaccines, and at age 82, please dear, I'd like to get one. Plus, does this Nanaimo bar look right to you? You would never make anything that looks quite like this. Oh, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> a very Canadian dessert dispute. This is The National. We start tonight with the CBC News investigation. After more than 40 years behind the bench, a junior hockey coach in Ontario was suddenly suspended earlier this year. Tonight, we can tell you why. It's because of dozens of inappropriate emails and texts sent to a player. Bernie Lynch was head coach of the Fort Francis Lakers in northwestern Ontario until January. That's when the player and his family complained. Now tonight, they are speaking out. We've agreed to protect their identities because they are concerned about backlash. Jonathan Gatehouse takes us through the story. She only discovered it by chance, an email left open on the family computer to her 20-year-old son from his hockey coach. Some things sort of struck me. There was language usage and uh, content that was not appropriate. It turned out to be only one of many concerning emails Bernie Lynch sent to his young charge. The last thing I think of when I go to sleep at night and the first thing I think of when I wake up is you, reads one email. Passionately missing you. I love you, he signs off. Dozens of unwanted messages, up to 50 in one day, cajoled, threatened and pleaded. My stomach and heart ache. I miss you so, said one text. He said I was his quote-unquote best friend, but I think he wanted more than that. Because the way he spoke and the way he was texting and whatnot, it, it sounded more like I was a lover than a friend. Just one ticket. Yeah. At first, the player thought Lynch wanted to help him. Then he says things got more intense. The coach pressured him to hang out at his apartment and became angry when the player refused. This, to me, seems predatory. It is completely in, in violation of a coach-player uh, relationship and the way in which a coach should communicate to a player and this is not right. On January 1st, the player's parents sent the team president an email outlining their concerns, sharing the texts and emails. The next day, Lynch was suspended without pay in order to have no contact with players. Hockey Canada, the sports governing body, is investigating, but to date, neither the player nor his mother have been contacted by anyone from the organization. Hockey Canada declined to explain why that is or to provide CBC News with any details of its investigation. CBC News has spoken to a number of Fort Francis players who shared other concerns about Lynch, detailing bullying behaviour and his use of sexually charged language and slurs during practices and in the dressing room. When asked about all of these allegations, Lynch declined to speak to CBC News and says he has yet to be contacted by anyone involved in the investigation. Okay, and so Jonathan, what else have you learned about this coach? We've been looking back at Bernie Lynch's career, which spans more than four decades and involves teams across Canada, the US and Europe, and we've learned of similar allegations in the past, including a police investigation 20 years ago in Saskatchewan, which did not result in charges. We'll have more on all of this in the coming days. Okay, Jonathan Gatehouse, thank you. Talks on a rescue package for Canada's airlines are said to be in their final stages and Air Canada may be prepared to pay back passengers for flights cancelled because of the pandemic. That's a key condition towards reaching any deal. But as Ashley Burke tells us, there's still some turbulence. Please follow social distancing rules. It's an industry in pain, cutting regional routes and workers as the pandemic stretches on, decimating air traffic. But sources say the government is close to reaching a deal with airlines to help. 
my understanding is the solution is imminent, but frankly, I thought it was imminent over a month ago. So we'll see where this thing ends up, but it's got to get done quick. Jerry Diaz represents 15,000 airline workers. He says talks with the government are over a seven to nine billion dollar package in low interest loans for the industry. And there are conditions. I do know firsthand that Air Canada has already committed uh, to uh, repay the customers uh, that are quite frustrated over um, receiving their money back. A sign of negotiations progressing. We've been really clear uh, that refunds are a precondition uh, to any deal. Some Air Canada passengers were relieved. Elated. I mean, it's good to hear that there is some lighter than the tunnel. Sean Lee Hyung's out $700. His Air Canada flight to Barcelona for a friend's wedding canceled due to COVID-19. He spent the last nine months trying to get his money back with no luck. I do have concerns it's gonna, if it will happen, but it's sort of, at least it's hope, before there was none. The Business Council of Canada's concerns are that Canadian airlines are falling behind other countries where governments have already provided packages and say that could hurt customers later. I think it's really, really important that Canadians um, are aware that the choices that they had before, the price competitiveness that they had before, will not be there for them the more these airlines are, are on life support. That could mean fewer airlines flying, fewer routes and prices much higher than before. Ashley, what is it that's still being sorted out between the government and the airlines for this deal to be reached? Well, Adrian, these talks are confidential. Airlines, including Air Canada, say they cannot comment publicly. But sources say that while the talks are progressing, there are still points of tension, including WestJet wanting the government to release plans about restarting the industry once it's safe to do so, something that the government has been reluctant to do because the future of the industry is unclear. Now, the Globe and Mail has also reported the government has asked for some sort of equity stake in companies in exchange for these loans, meaning that it could own a percentage of the business. All right, interesting. Ashley Burke in Ottawa. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. And it's not just airlines looking to Ottawa for financial support during this crisis. Most of Canada's premiers made a united demand today for a huge increase to federal health care funding. Here's David Cochran on how much they're looking for and how the feds are responding. Welcome to this news conference of the Council of Federation. This is how the premiers come together in the age of COVID, gathering virtually to send a message to Ottawa. Our health system face a financial problem, a major financial problem. A problem, they say, $28 billion a year in federal funding could help solve. An old demand packaged in a coordinated way with a clear target. I raised the example with the Prime Minister of a young woman who uh, felt a lump on her breast. Premiers using personal stories to put personal pressure on the Prime Minister. When I raised this story, a true story with the Prime Minister. He looked across the table at me and said, I'm not your banker. I don't need a banker. We don't need a banker. Canadians don't need a banker. We need a partner. In a statement, the Prime Minister's office said, we don't know what the Premier is talking about. The Prime Minister worked collaboratively with Premiers to have Canadians backs through this crisis. Some of these premiers have cut taxes. Others don't have a sales tax. But they all say they can't make ends meet because of the federal government and warn it will get worse. We have not any idea yet what the cost, the long-term cost will be for those who will suffer long-term symptoms from COVID-19. The federal government isn't saying no, just not mid-pandemic, when it's already financing most of the country's COVID costs. If COVID-19, and God, we all hope that's the case, uh, is, is looking like it's in the rearview mirror this summer, that would be the time where the government of Canada would be in a position to say to them, this is the amount of money that we're prepared to spend. The premiers were hoping, though likely not expecting, to get this money in the upcoming budget, the focus of which will overwhelmingly be on the crisis of the pandemic and the economic recovery. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And Rosie and the Ad Issue panel are going to pick up on this, dissecting the Premier's strategy and how it could all play into the next federal election. That's in about 20 minutes. Today, Health Canada reaffirmed that its review of the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine is going well, and approval could be right around the corner. We're expecting to have that completed and a decision uh, in the next few days, I would say within the next seven days or so. Health Canada is also moving to fast-track modified vaccine booster shots, targeting 
COVID-19 variants, Moderna, Pfizer and AstraZeneca are all working on boosters. Health Canada will not require them to submit clinical trial data. Instead, it will rely on lab work to speed things up. Meanwhile, Ontarians are waiting for the vaccination drive itself to speed up, especially in Toronto, where seniors over 80 and their families are getting increasingly worried. The city still has not started giving them shots or even articulated a detailed plan. Here's Mac to Salasa on how that is fraying nerves. In the race to get vaccines into arms, seniors living in Toronto are worried they're being left behind. They're stressing it's a race between the variants and the vaccines and at age 82, please dear, I'd like to get one. Parts of the province opened up vaccination sites to people age 80 and above this week, but some have had to wait in long lines out in the cold. Meanwhile, Toronto has no city-run sites giving shots to that age group. Officials said they were waiting for the provincial booking site to go up on March 15th and for more vaccines. That time period where they don't have the supply, they should have been planning. Like, why isn't this already done? Like, Suzanne Sutcliffe is worried and can't understand why her 97-year-old mother, a veteran, is left waiting. And she's frail and vulnerable. Like There's the weight and the feeling like, you know, I'm walking on a tightrope, you know, variants, PSWs coming in and out. Some hospitals are forging ahead on their own. They've set up pre-registration sites and some have even started giving out shots. Unity Health Toronto started vaccinating a small number of 80 plus year old patients this week at its hospitals, with more to come next week. This doctor's patients got to be part of the pilot project. It's very rare that you really get to give um, what feels like a gift to patients um, and bring them such good news. But this should be happening right now across the city, says this doctor, and she blames the province for its planning. We just need to ramp it up in a major way and get everyone vaccinated. A pilot project to get pharmacists helping with that kicks off next week in three regions, including Toronto. But the wait continues for these two for now. Makta Gebra Salasa, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Ontario's College of Physicians and Surgeons has issued three cautions to an Ontario pediatrician saying some of her tweets about COVID-19 have been misleading, misinformed and irresponsible. The judgment follows multiple complaints about tweets from Dr. Kalvinder Kaur Gill. In a series of posts last summer, Dr. Gill criticized lockdown measures and even stated a vaccine was not needed. The college says Dr. Gill plans to appeal at least two of the cautions. Life in lockdown has been tough for Canadians, and it's put women at a greater risk of domestic violence. Yesterday, the Quebec Premier addressed the province's recent surge in femicide. But as Sarah Levitt explains, many say the solution needs to be more than just words. I was shocked. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it. The murder of a woman in Laval, Quebec, is sending shockwaves as far as Haiti. From Port-au-Prince, Carol Pedre says he can't believe his friend Marie-Edouard is dead. The last time he saw her was the summer when the Haitian woman visited to celebrate her recovery from COVID-19. She survived COVID. She was like, I have to do a photo shoot because I want to live my life right now. Two weeks ago, the 32-year-old was shot dead outside her apartment building. Just 48 hours earlier, she'd gone to police to report a threat on her life. Edouard is just one of five women who have been murdered in Quebec in the past month alone. Yesterday, Premier François Legault addressed the issue at the start of a health briefing. Y a rien de masculin. Not mincing words, Legault said he was speaking directly to men, telling them there is nothing masculine about violence against women. Now, women's groups across the province have a message of their own for Legault. They want Action. It's useless for me that uh, Prime Minister Legault says he's ashamed. It's a shame for, for the men. It's a shame for Quebec government not to act. A rise in violence against women isn't just a Quebec problem. The assaulted women's helpline says at times it's fielding almost twice the number of calls from across the country. The pandemic is a major factor. Women are in a, an extremely precarious situation because they're doubly isolated. 
they were isolated before, but not. Uh, but now they can't even go out. They, we can't go out after a certain time. We can't go to a uh, another region. We can't uh, escape. As for Marie Edouard, police are still investigating, but have yet to arrest a suspect. The police or whoever was working on that on that case didn't take her seriously, or didn't maybe believe her. A mistake he says that ultimately led to her death. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. Alberta's opposition is calling for a public inquiry into a deadly COVID-19 outbreak at a meatpacking facility in Red Deer. There have been outbreaks in meatpacking plants all over the country. However, in other provinces, shutdowns occurred well before the infection numbers got anywhere close to what we've been seeing here in Alberta. The comments come a day after a fourth death was linked to the Olimel plant. In all, more than 500 cases have been connected to the facility, which partially reopened its doors today after shutting down on February 15th. In the midst of this pandemic, more Canadians are turning to high-interest payday loans to just get them through. It's quick cash at a high price, with interest rates sometimes close to 50%. As Diane Buckner tells us, pressure is mounting on the government to take action against so-called predatory lenders. Patricia Edwards didn't qualify for a bank loan, so when her two daughters needed help to pay their bills, she took a $3,000 installment loan from a payday lender. So I was like, okay, let's see if I qualify for the loan because I'm working at the hospital. Now she's out of work and struggling to pay a 47% interest rate on top of her own bills. If I could get a $10,000 visa card for 19%, I would get the visa card and go pay, 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 pay them all off, and then I'll only own 19% on the visa card. This borrower, who wants to keep her identity confidential, also turned to a payday lender after she couldn't get a bank loan to support her sick mother. Bills were piling up because she was out of work for so long, so I figured I would take the loan to at least help with our rent. She too lost her job during the pandemic and was forced to refinance. Now she's struggling to stay on top of three high-interest loans. In a statement to CBC News, the group that represents many of these lenders says its members are highly regulated and licensed under provincial legislation across Canada, and that unsecured loans are costly to provide. Acorn Canada, a national agency that advocates for low-income people, has been stepping up pressure, urging the federal government to limit what alternative lenders can charge. A lot of people are using or taking these loans to buy food, to pay their rent. It is urgent. This senator says she intends to launch a bill that would cap interest rates at 20 percent. Canada is, is like a, a gold mine to these institutions because of the current state of legislation we have in place. On the first day but Patricia Edwards is among those calling on Ottawa to take action more urgently. Hopefully, you know, we can get the attention of those who have more power than us. She hopes to see new rules announced in the upcoming federal budget. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, turning now to Nova Scotia, with an update on an ongoing conflict between Indigenous and commercial fishermen. Ottawa is saying Indigenous fisheries can operate, but only within the commercial fishing season. Kayla Hounsel shows us how that's going down. On the day the Sebeginegadi First Nation was celebrating the return of seized lobster traps from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the minister also delivered a blow. Mi'kmaq fishers will have to fish within a regulated commercial season if they want to legally catch and sell lobster. We're a treaty-based fishery and those treaties have not changed. We're going to continue to fish those treaties. Moderate livelihood fishing takes. Chief Mike Zach has been the face of the fight since his community launched what's known as a moderate livelihood fishery last fall. Band members have been fishing out of season, insisting they have a treaty right to do so that was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada more than two decades ago. It led to violence with non-Indigenous commercial fishers who have maintained their concerned about conservation of the lobster stocks. Sack says his people can't fish within the season because it takes place in the winter and their boats aren't big enough. You could literally fit four of our boats on one of their boats, so it's just apples and oranges. The Mi'kmaq say the decision has been made without adequate consultation. 
The fisheries minister says this is about implementing their right to fish, but that the Supreme Court decision also says treaty rights are subject to regulation as long as it can be justified. It's extremely important for conservation reasons to make sure that the moderate livelihood fishery also takes part place during a season when uh, lobsters are, are replenished. Commercial fishers say enforcement will be key. I think there's still a lot of work to be done to satisfy the rights of Indigenous people and also to protect the, the fishery for all of us. The minister says DFO officers will be out on the water to stop illegal fishing. Chief Sachs says he'll support his people in court if he has to, but hopes it doesn't come to that. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, more details are emerging about Tuesday night's risky operation to save 31 crew members from the Atlantic destiny off the coast of Nova Scotia. Our aircraft um, had a, uh, a malfunction which the crew responded to and handled uh, according to all standard operating procedures. So one of the Canadian helicopters assisting that night was forced to abort partway through. Fortunately, two U.S. Coast Guard helicopters stepped in, lifting 21 crew members to safety. The next morning, six people still on board were forced to jump from the ship onto a small Canadian Coast Guard vessel just moments before the Atlantic destiny sank into the ocean. New signs tonight of the growing rift between Prince Harry, Meghan, and Buckingham Palace. I don't know how they could expect that after all of this time, we would still just be silent. Next on The National, why both sides are now facing allegations. At issue tackles the Premier's plea for more federal money. Now is the time to act and increase the Canada health transfer. But is now the time to ask? And a New York Times cooking photo stirs up a very Canadian controversy. The ratio is, is, is kind of all wrong. The, the, the bottom, the base layer, the coconut and chocolate, and the custard layer. Nanaimo bar? More like recipe for disaster. We're back in two. Tsunami alarm sounded on New Zealand's North Island today after a third strong earthquake struck the area in a matter of hours. The latest, a magnitude 8, following two others with a magnitude above 7. Thousands evacuated to higher ground while residents in Auckland were put on alert. What we're asking people is to try and stay calm, touch base with people that you love, uh, check on the people that you know might be most at risk, um, and to uh, really just listen to the advice that is coming through. Fortunately, there are no reports of damage or casualties from the quakes, and the tsunami threat level has now been downgraded. There are more rumblings of discord tonight in the royal family, with the Duchess of Sussex accusing Buckingham Palace of spreading falsehoods about her and her husband, Prince Harry. Margaret Evans explains the rift. How do you feel about the palace hearing you speak your truth today? A teaser for the Oprah Winfrey interview with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, better known as Harry and Meghan. Even before the ad started appearing, media reports here had the royal family bracing itself for a coming storm. I don't know how they could expect that after all of this time, we would still just be silent if there is an active role that the firm is playing in perpetuating falsehoods about us. Good evening, Megan. The interview will also touch on Harry's acrimonious relationship with the British media and the blame he places on the tabloids in particular for hounding his mother, Princess Diana, something he says he feared seeing repeated with Meghan. Yesterday, the Times newspaper here published a story about alleged bullying complaints against Meghan by former aides. That prompted a response from the palace, which issued a statement saying it's very concerned about the allegations and pledging to investigate them. Effectively, you have sanctioning from the Queen to launch an investigation into allegations against her grandson and his wife um, in terms of bullying. It couldn't be more serious. It couldn't be more high stakes. Yeah, I'd love one. Just last yeah, week, Harry was seen cavorting on a double-decker bus in Los Angeles in another high-profile interview, talking about Zooming with his grandparents. This week, his and Meghan's representatives have accused Buckingham Palace of orchestrating a smear campaign against them. The no one seems to be playing happy families anymore. We're certainly seeing in the last few weeks an, a, an unbelievable decline in what was already a really strained relationship. 
and all in the midst of a pandemic, the country in lockdown, and Harry's 99-year-old grandfather, Prince Philip, still in hospital. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, ahead tonight, the New York Times post that has Canadians shaken their heads. It sounds like you'd never make anything that looks like this. Oh, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the bottom of the so-called Nanaimo bar. Next, though, Rosie's here with that issue. Adrian, today the Premier has made their case again for more federal health care funding. Canadians don't need a banker, we need a partner. But is Ottawa listening this time? Chantal, Andrew and Althea will join all of us to talk about that after the break. Today, we'll all have the same message for the failed government. Now is the time to act and increase the Canada health transfer. We need to address this issue now. In this upcoming budget, in the COVID context, when health matters more than ever. It shouldn't take a pandemic to get the attention of the federal government on this, this important topic. Canadians don't need a banker, we need a partner. It's time for the Prime Minister to step up, to work with the provinces, and become a true funding partner. If this is not the time to talk about health care, when would that be? In case you didn't get that, the premiers presented a united message today calling for an increase in federal health care funding from uh, about 22 percent up to 35. So is Ottawa listening? Is now the time for that conversation? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. It's the time for that conversation here anyway. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne and Althea Raj. This is not the first time, Althea, that we have uh, seen the premiers make this call, but it did feel like a bit of a pile on uh, today uh, because it was heavily coordinated and choreographed. How, how do you think that message was received? Uh, well, it was not welcomed, but it wasn't surprising either. Um, the Prime Minister's point of view has not changed. The Premier's point of view has not changed. I mean, this is a story where their vote actually kind of right. Um, and the Premiers are trying to put pressure uh, on two fronts. One, they are hoping that this is going to be in the budget. Um, it's probably not going to be in the budget, as the <laughs> Prime Minister has suggested, because he said, I want to deal with COVID first, and we'll talk yeah. about health care transfers first, for after. Um, but the key point is that uh, they want unconditional transfers, and Ottawa wants conditional transfers. And it was pretty funny, actually, listening to this press conference and watching Jason Kenney twist himself into a pretzel, saying that, you know, when they, the Conservatives were in power, while the, the provinces were overspending on health care, but now that he's a provincial premier, you know, everything is not at all the same. The provinces have tightened their belt and Ottawa really needs to pony up more money. It's clear that this is either going to be something that uh, Ottawa needs to deal with uh, as a government or it's something that's going to happen during the campaign because the provincial premiers have also said uh, that they plan to make this an election issue. Chantal, I mean, I do see the, 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 the federal government's point. Like, this seems like... It seems like the wrong time to start this negotiation, but at the same time, it's what a lot of Canadians are thinking about is the state of our health care system, too. Yes, but as Elvia says, it cuts both ways. Uh, for one, how many conversations uh, did Stephen Harper have with the premiers uh, when he was in power over how much uh, he was going to transfer for health care? The short answer is zero. So let's settle that there. Second, how successful were the premiers or most premiers the last time they brought an issue in an election campaign? That would be a year and a half ago, and it would be called the carbon tax. And here we are today. <laughs> so, uh, it, yes, the, the Canadians are concerned about funding for health care. They usually are. But they are also concerned about what they saw in long-term care, which is Justin Trudeau's entry into the conversation. So it might well be that if the premiers want to achieve some measure of success on an increase in health transfers, and I'm not saying they don't have a case, except I've heard that case for 20 years, yeah, yeah. and I've not noticed that it impacted on election outcomes. But if they want it, they might want to start the conversation on something other than send us money. Yeah. 
uh, Andrew, what, what did you make of their their plea and and how it's well, I mean, it really hasn't been well received because nothing's happened since the first time they made it. Or, or the hundredth time they made it. Yeah, I mean, the right. one thing the one thing the premiers can ever agree on is more money from Ottawa. And let's be clear, it's more money. It's not more money for health care. The dollars don't have little labels attached to them. They can spend them <laughs> any way they see any way they see fit. Um, there, you can make a coherent argument. It's contentious, but you can at least make a coherent argument for conditional transfers. If Ottawa wants or needs or deserves some role in in impinging on provincial imperatives uh, with health care, then it's perfectly entitled to attach conditions and the provinces can take it or leave it. There's no, as I say, you, you can disagree with that if you like, but there's mm -hmm. not even any coherence to the argument for unconditional transfers. Uh, this is the problem we have in this country is that we have a health care system where you really can't know who's responsible for spending and who's responsible for results. It just allows each level of government to point the finger at each other mm -hmm. interminably. Uh, where the provinces have a case is in the long run. In the long run, uh, we are facing an aging population. Most of the costs of that are going to be for health care. Most of that is going to be on the provinces. That's a strong argument for transferring tax room to the provinces, not just transferring dollars, but giving them tax responsibility, yeah. which is money they then raise from their publics and have to be responsible to their, uh, their, their electorates for how it's spent. That's the long-term solution to this. Simply shoveling more money that's, that's in the form of cash transfers, it just means more of the same uh, endless game of finger pointing, and it was, it's not helpful, and it's not, uh, it should not be a priority at this moment when the federal government is juggling, juggling every other ball it can think of. Sorry, Althea, you went in there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that that's fair. I think most Canadians who interact with the healthcare uh, ser services sector uh, feel that there is a great need. The problem, and I think Andrew alluded to this, is that while you know Quebec might want help funding uh, the 8,000 new posts that it's created this year in the yeah. long run, you have Jason Kenney, who actually is making the prime minister's argument uh, for him by not being there, by saying, well, we cut taxes this year and we intend to do that again because that's where our focus is. Well, Ottawa doesn't want to send more money if instead of investing it in the healthcare sector, you're going to be using it to cut taxes. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, I, well, it, there's, there's still an issue, if we're going to get into it, that we're not <laughs> nearly, we're not even close to, to knowing whether we're getting a, a proper uh, um, bang for a buck from the amount that we're spending now in the healthcare system. Yeah. Uh, the system is still largely unreformed. Mostly it's unreformed because anytime there's pressure to reform it, Ottawa comes along with more money. Uh, Chantal, la last point on that. I'll just go to messaging. If you keep doing the same thing and it brings the same outcome, in this case, nothing, uh, uh, and no sign that you're really mobilizing public opinion, you're probably in need of a different strategy. I don't have a lot of time, but obviously they're doing this too because they see the amount of money the government is shoveling out right now uh, in terms of the government's pandemic spending. And there were some questions this week about <laughs> whether it's been, quote-unquote, too much. Here's what Christia Freeland had to say about that. I've been surprised to read some commentary suggesting that Canadians may be doing too well for their own good. Some have pointed to rising household disposable incomes in the first nine months of last year as evidence that our government acted too swiftly and too effectively to support Canadians. I disagree. Andrew, what did you make of, of her defense there or the criticism itself that the government, by extending uh, support systems into June now, is, is being, quote unquote, too helpful? Well, the specific criticism is they've given people way more money than actually was required in terms of their lost wages and income. The point of this was to keep people whole. They've gone way more than keeping people whole. Without the transfers, incomes, disposable incomes would have been down about 4%. With them, they're up 17%. So they're giving people way more than was actually required, which would be fine if money were free. If you're having to borrow that money, even at low interest rates, low for, for a time, then that becomes a different matter. You, it's, you can say, look, it was, it, it was a crisis situation. It was yeah. an emergency. No one had time to, to, to get everything fixed around. That's fine. But if you're looking forward and you're now talking about layering on another $100 billion in stimulus on top of the money that's already been tucked away in people's savings accounts, just waiting to be spent, mm -hmm. then I think you say, okay, you've got to start. It may have been a forgivable mistake in the, early, in, the, in the short run, but in the long run, how are you going to react to that? Are you going to just layer on more money on top of that, or are you going to start to, 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 to pull it back? Okay, don't have long. Chantal. 
for one, I didn't hear any premier complain about Ottawa being too generous. Just setting that aside. And second, I am uncomfortable uh, about doing the macro analysis of this, thinking about people in low-income jobs who have mm -hmm. woken up the next morning with zero jobs and saying, oh, they all got too much money, so I'm going to stay away from this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Althea, last word to you. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's important to note that we're talking about in the aggregate, whereas some people got a lot of money that probably did not lose any income at all. And you have people, like I'm thinking about 15-year-olds who got CERB, yeah. um, and you have people who lost all of their income and they were barely just getting by. And so she was trying to recast the issue because the government, frankly, deserves to be criticized for some of the programs that were ill thought out. Why would you give thousands of dollars to teenagers who live with their parents? That did not make sense. Okay. Good conversation, everybody. Thank you. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to Ad Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're going to talk about the politics of bailouts. You can find that on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Okay, Rosie, you know the drill. Uh, this is the time when you spill. Uh, what are you working on for this Sunday's Rosemary Barton Live? Well, I know that CBC is going to be looking back at the year that was when the pandemic started, which is around uh, this t next week, last year. Uh, and we're going to try and do that a little bit on the show, too. We're going to talk to Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Teresa Tam, about what she is expecting in the weeks and months ahead. And we're going to do the thing I want to do the most on this show, on my show every week. And that's talk to people who are about to get vaccinated, because who can get tired of that story? Fantastic. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks. Well, we've all watched schools scramble to adapt to COVID times, but what about other classes? We are really uh, going above and beyond what Toronto Public Health is asking us. Next, how language and cultural classes are staying safe and engaging. Plus, if this photo makes you cringe, you are not alone. The Canadians calling out the New York Times for its take on the Nanaimo bar. Well, just as schools have had to make all kinds of changes to become pandemic safe, so have other kinds of classes, like language and cultural studies. And as Deanna Sumanak-Johnson explains, they've had to face some extra challenges too. Masked and distanced, they're learning all about their family's culture. This Greek language school used to teach a thousand kids all over Toronto. Since the pandemic, it has just 400 students, some learning online, some in person at the Greek Cultural Centre. Tough changes to make, but necessary, says its director. We did cap the size of our classes to 10 students. We are really uh, going above and beyond what Toronto Public Health is asking us because for us, it was more important to keep these schools open and working. Language and cultural schools across Canada have had to deal with some of the same challenges as public schools and a few extra hurdles, like figuring out where to hold classes, with some of the usual places no longer an option. In Calgary, this imam decided to move Arabic language and Islamic studies classes entirely online. He felt keeping distance and sticking to the rules in schools was enough pressure on the kids. So we didn't want to add to that stress and exacerbate and aggravate whatever they're dealing with. So we said, look, you go to school during the day, you come home, let's have your evening classes online. Dalton. But keeping students engaged during the pandemic isn't easy, whether online or in person, where wearing a mask can get in the way of teaching language. I tend to express a lot with my facial expressions and like when I'm wearing masks, they will feel me less or like in like a slower um, um, pace. So like I will try to kind of adapt to that a little bit. Still for many, the hurdles are worth it. I like about there's a recess and you could learn different letters. So for all I need some normalcy and some fun in a year where both are sorely needed. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Next, the New York Times gives a shout out to Canada's beloved Nanaimo bars and Canada shouts back. People take, take very strong sides with Canadian treats. Okay, so what's wrong with this picture? The backlash over a baking flub after the break.
I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, why a former Guantanamo Bay prisoner, now the subject of a Hollywood feature, wants an apology from Canada. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, Canadians are pretty proud of their iconic Nanaimo bars. So when New York Times Cooking posted this on its Instagram account, it got a bit of a reaction. So maybe just not the one the Times expected. To the horror of many in this country, the picture amounts to Custard's Last Stand. Thomas Deglin explains. When Canadians drift off into dreams of sweet treats, here's what many picture. That Vancouver Island export, part of the country's culinary culture like few other confections. Surely not this. What the New York Times dared present on Instagram as a Nanaimo bar, audaciously adding, Canadians, this one's for you. The ratio is, is, is kind of all wrong. The, the, the bottom, the base layer, the coconut and chocolate, and the custard layer should, uh, in my mind, be more equal. Some dessert lovers on social media were less diplomatic, calling it un-Canadian, a sad square, or even a brownie. This is exactly what an Nanaimo bar should look like. This is the proportion. And Susan Mendelson should know. She wrote the definitive recipe in her 1980 book, Mama Never Cooked Like This. So it sounds like you'd never make anything that looks like this. Oh, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> What's more, the New York Times actually used her recipe when it told readers about the Nanaimo bar two years ago. So how did those well-proportioned goodies become these unshapely imposters? Well, here's the official answer. There was an offset spatula situation going on and you got a ripple effect, um, kind of like you know a pond refrozen after a couple of warm days. In 2019, Canada Post defended against complaints about a Nanaimo bar stamp with an outsized custard layer, saying there are variations on the dessert across the country. The neat thing about cuisine is um, it's a language and it evolves and it's live and recipes change as they pass down through time. Remember, Canadians eat food all the time. That's a departure from the original. Think pizza or sushi, but... People take very strong sides with Canadian treats. And that's just Nanaimo bars. Don't get us started on butter tarts. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Wow. <laughs> that's a good story. Next on The National, a sweet message to a favorite grocery store clerk. The story behind this poster and just how much it meant. Next in a moment. Emmy Green just turned four years old, and there's one thing she knows for sure, she misses seeing Calvin, her favorite grocery store clerk. They haven't seen, enough, seen each other for a while because of the pandemic. So Emmy decided to create something for Calvin to show him just how much she misses him. And tonight it's our moment. I miss Calvin. I miss seeing him at grocery store. Emmy really made my day. Her mother said, well, Emmy, who do you miss? And with COVID-19, you can't see him. And she said, Calvin. And her mother said she didn't tell her. She just came up with Calvin and Dominion. I write my name, E-M-M-Y. I mean too much to her, and she means too much to me. And then I knew there and then with that poster like this, it's just for real, like out of all the people, or maybe your grandparents or your uncles, aunts, anybody, Every time she goes shopping with her mom, she used to say, Mommy, can we go through that nice man's chicken? <laughs> it made me feel that I was special. Like for a kid at that age to focus on me and, and to, to give me a feeling of being special. And I thought to myself, and she's special too, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Totally. Sweetness in spades. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, and so great little addendum to this. Uh, the two actually got to speak together, uh, speak to each other on CBC Radio on the St. Yep. John's Morning Show. First thing she said, I love you, Calvin. Nice. So <laughs> they haven't seen each other since before Christmas. Uh, apparently last time they did, Emmy tried to hug him, and he said, no, I'm going to show you the elbow hug. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that's great. Love it. That is The National for March the 4th. Good night. Good night.